It all starts with artificial intelligence. A machine has been programmed to see and to move objects. AI isn't new. The term was coined back in 1956. In 1958, Cornell University psychologist Frank Rosenblatt built the perceptron, designed to mimic how neurons fire in our brains. So here's a basic model of how neurons in our brains work. An individual neuron can either fire or not, so its level of activation can be represented as a 1 or a 0. The input to one neuron is the output from a bunch of other neurons, but the strength of these connections between neurons varies, so each one can be given a different weight. Some connections are excitatory, so they have positive weights, while others are inhibitory, so they have negative weights. And the way to figure out whether a particular neuron fires is to take the activation of each input neuron and multiply by its weight and then add these all together. If their sum is greater than some number, called the bias, then the neuron fires. But if it's less than that, the neuron doesn't fire. As input, Rosenblatt's perceptron had 400 photocells arranged in a square grid to capture a 20 by 20 pixel image. You can think of each pixel as an input neuron, with its activation being the brightness of the pixel. Although, strictly speaking, the activation should be either 0 or 1, we can let it take any value between 0 and 1. All of these neurons are connected to a single output neuron, each via its own adjustable weight. So to see if the output neuron will fire, you multiply the activation of each neuron by its weight and add them together. This is essentially a vector dot product. If the answer is larger than the bias, the neuron fires, and if not, it doesn't. Now, the goal of the perceptron was to reliably distinguish between two images, like a rectangle and a circle. For example, the output neuron could always fire when presented with a circle, but never when presented with a rectangle. To achieve this, the perceptron had to be trained, that is, shown a series of different circles and rectangles, and have its weights adjusted accordingly. We can visualize the weights as an image, since there's a unique weight for each pixel of the image. Initially, Rosenblatt set all the weights to zero. If the perceptron's output is correct, for example, here it's shown a rectangle and the output neuron doesn't fire, no change is made to the weights. But if it's wrong, then the weights are adjusted. The algorithm for updating the weights is remarkably simple. Here, the output neuron didn't fire when it was supposed to because it was shown a circle. So to modify the weights, you simply add the input activations to the weights. If the output neuron fires when it shouldn't, like here when shown a rectangle, well then you subtract the input activations from the weights. And you keep doing this until the perceptron correctly identifies all the training images. It was shown that this algorithm will always converge so long as it's possible to map the two categories into distinct groups. The perceptron was capable of distinguishing between different shapes like rectangles and triangles or between different letters. And according to Rosenblatt, it could even tell the difference between cats and dogs. He said the machine was capable of what amounts to original thought. And the media lapped it up. The New York Times called the perceptron the embryo of an electronic computer that the Navy expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. After training on lots of examples, it's given new faces it has never seen and is able to successfully distinguish male from female. It has learned. In reality, the perceptron was pretty limited in what it could do. It could not, in fact, tell apart dogs from cats. This and other critiques were raised in a book by MIT giants Minsky and Papert in 1969. And that led to a bust period for artificial neural networks and AI in general. It's known as the first AI winter. Rosenblatt did not survive this winter. He drowned while sailing in Chesapeake Bay on his 43rd birthday. The NavLab is a roadworthy truck, modified so that researchers or computers can control the vehicle as occasion demands. In the 1980s, there was an AI resurgence when researchers at Carnegie Mellon created one of the first self-driving cars. The vehicle was steered by an artificial neural network called Alvin. 
It was similar to the perceptron, except it had a hidden layer of artificial neurons between the input and output. As input, Alvin received 30 by 32 pixel images of the road ahead. Here I'm showing them as 60 by 64 pixels. But each of these input neurons was connected via an adjustable weight to a hidden layer of four neurons. These were each connected to 32 output neurons. So to go from one layer of the network to the next, you perform a matrix multiplication. The input activation times the weights. The output neuron with the greatest activation determines the steering angle. To train the neural net, a human drove the vehicle, providing the correct steering angle for a given input image. All the weights in the neural network were adjusted through the training so that Alvin's output better matched that of the human driver. The method for adjusting the weights is called backpropagation, which I won't go into here, but Welch Labs has a great series on this which I'll link to in the description. Again, you can visualize the weights for the four hidden neurons as images. The weights are initially set to be random, but as training progresses, the computer learns to pick up on certain patterns. You can see the road markings emerge in the weights. Simultaneously, the output steering angle coalesces onto the human steering angle. The computer drove the vehicle at a top speed of around 1 or 2 kilometers per hour. It was limited by the speed at which the computer could perform matrix multiplication. Despite these advances, artificial neural networks still struggled with seemingly simple tasks, like telling apart cats and dogs. And no one knew whether hardware or software was the weak link. I mean, did we have a good model of intelligence, we just needed more computer power? Or did we have the wrong idea about how to make intelligence systems altogether? So artificial intelligence experienced another lull in the 1990s. By the mid-2000s, most AI researchers were focused on improving algorithms, but one researcher, Fei-Fei Li, thought maybe there was a different problem. Maybe these artificial neural networks just needed more data to train on. So she planned to map out the entire world of objects. From 2006 to 2009, she created ImageNet, a database of 1.2 million human-labeled images, which at the time was the largest labeled image dataset ever constructed. And from 2010 to 2017, ImageNet ran an annual contest, the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, where software programs competed to correctly detect and classify images. Images were classified into a thousand different categories, including 90 different dog breeds. A neural network competing in this competition would have an output layer of a thousand neurons, each corresponding to a category of object that could appear in the image. If the image contained, say, a German Shepherd, then the output neuron corresponding to German Shepherd should have the highest activation. Unsurprisingly, it turned out to be a tough challenge. One way to judge the performance of an AI is to see how often the five highest neuron activations do not include the correct category. This is the so-called top five error rate. In 2010, the best performer had a top five error rate of 28.2%, meaning that nearly a third of the time, the correct answer was not among its top five guesses. In 2011, the error rate of the best performer was 25.8%, a substantial improvement. But the next year, an artificial neural network from the University of Toronto called AlexNet blew away the competition with a top five error rate of just 16.4%. What set AlexNet apart was its size and depth. The network consisted of eight layers and in total 500,000 neurons. To train AlexNet, 60 million weights and biases had to be carefully adjusted using the training database. Because of all the big matrix multiplications, processing a single image required 700 million individual math operations, so training was computationally intensive. The team managed it by pioneering the use of GPUs, graphical processing units, which are traditionally used for driving displays, screens, so they're specialized for fast parallel computations. The AlexNet paper describing their research is a blockbuster. It's now been cited over a hundred thousand times, and it identifies the scale of the neural network as key to its success. It takes a lot of computation to train and run the network, but the improvement in performance is worth it. With others following their lead, the top five error rate on the ImageNet competition plummeted in the years that followed, down to 3.6% in 2015. That is better than human performance. The neural network that achieved this had a hundred layers of neurons. 
So the future is clear. We will see ever increasing demand for ever larger neural networks. And this is a problem for several reasons. One is energy consumption. Training a neural network requires an amount of electricity similar to the yearly consumption of three households. Another issue is the so-called von Neumann bottleneck. Virtually every modern digital computer stores data in memory and then accesses it as needed over a bus. When performing the huge matrix multiplications required by deep neural networks, most of the time and energy goes into fetching those weight values rather than actually doing the computation. And finally, there are the limitations of Moore's law. For decades, the number of transistors on a chip has been doubling approximately every two years. But now, the size of a transistor is approaching the size of an atom. So there are some fundamental physical challenges to further miniaturization.